Let's make welcome one of the greatest preachers of our times, Brother Jeff Arnold. Praise the Lord, everybody. We are so, so honored to be here with you. I can't see the clock, but I'll make believe like I'm interested. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. It should go without saying that we have been divinely orchestrated to the moment. Those of you that have been here from the beginning with Dr. Maxwell should have felt and heard from his spirit and heart, his verbiage revealing the pulse of his spirit. God is calling us to honesty. Stop all the role playing. I heard him scream it a dozen times. Get a life. Get a life. And then every speaker that's come across this platform again has built us to this moment. And... Uh, I bring to you what God said to me. I am honored to be here. Thank you very much. Joshua chapter 3. And uh, begin please with verse 1. Thank you Brother Mangan, the staff, everybody. You're just great people. Thank you all the people that have gestured my way or touched me or said praying for you. Thank you very, very much. Glad to have a wonderful group from our home church here all our home people praying I have more information than I have time God will do something momentarily yes he will God is fixing to show himself strong it was not just a coincidence that brother fuller preached what he just preached it was not a fluke that brother jack cunningham said what he said today the lord awakened me in the motel again tuesday morning and early this morning and began to talk to me and uh, I had taught a very simple Bible study to our home church a month ago. And now God has and expanded it. And I pray that you'll just give me a few moments. I know I'm, I'm known for being long-winded. Five more minutes. But I'm going to do my best to, uh, to get in here and get out of here and, and go eat. Joshua chapter 3, and Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. And he, all the, he and all the children of Israel lodged there before they passed over. It came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I want to talk to you about the key to possessing our possessions. Lord, bless the teaching and the preaching and help me do a great job in a little bit of time. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Anybody 
besides me frustrated because it ain't happening? Well, that's 12 of you that are honest. Let me try it again. The mic probably wasn't on. Is there anybody besides me that wants the power, the supernatural, the operation? And we're trying to find out why it ain't happening. I think God's given me an answer. Oh, hallelujah. You, you can be seated. We have come now in the story of Israel to an end of the wandering and the beginning of the possessing. I'm not in a hurry. Let me try it again. And we have come, UPC, to the end of the wandering and the beginning of the possessing. All we need tonight for a few moments is the key. If we will use the key, we will cross over. Oh, hallelujah. God wants us to finally possess what He's promised. God wants us to experience what we blow off about. God wants us to have it happen now. Now you just, just hold on. I, I know where I'm going. The scripture tells us that they had come to the end of their journey. And now they were coming to a beginning of something brand new. And God in his infinite wisdom parked their carcasses right in the face of an obstacle that they couldn't do beans about. Everybody repeat with me. That river. That stinking river. That raging river. I hate that river. It's between me and what's been promised. Oh, hallelujah. God had a design for bringing them to that point, And I am totally convinced God has had a divine design to bring this movement and particularly this meeting to this time right now. Because we're feeling faith. We've got a high expectancy. We want to experience. We need one more little piece to the puzzle. I'm fixing to go over this thing because God didn't bring me this far to frustrate my faith. God has brought me that I might experience what He's promised as my possessions. Oh, hallelujah. You, you can be seated. God brought Israel to the riverbank. For one reason, to bring them to an end in themselves. The frustration that you and I have been feeling ain't from the devil. He's not that smart. He wants you and I tonight to realize our utter helplessness about getting across the obstacle. So the scripture says, he brings them to the river bank and then says, sit down and stare at what you can't fix. And let its raging waters mock you and laugh at you and resist you and hold you at bay. You're not hearing me yet. The key to possessing your possessions is the pause. Yeah. 
God said, before I show you my stuff, you stay here 72 hours and do two things. Remember how good I've been and realize you can do beans about what you're facing. I've had to deal with that river ever since I've been saved. It's laughed at me. It's mocked at me. I've chased you guys that know everybody's zip codes and pray people through, have all the gifts of the Spirit. Poor slob like me living in the ditches and the trenches. I can't get a headache healed. I can't hardly get anything done. I've been wondering, when am I going to whip that river? A month ago, God said, I'll tell you how to whip the river. Stop trying to do it in your flesh. Stop trying to do it in your ability. Stop trying to do it in what you think you can do. Sit down and stare at it and realize you can't do it. And may I say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, why would God show you some nifty stuff if you ain't thankful? He put Israel on the banks of an impossibility and required first, recollect, review, recall, remember what God has done. If I wasn't God, if I was God, I wouldn't give you nothing. Give you a griping and complaining and sucking your thumb and talking about crud and garbage and stupid stuff. God wants to work with thankful people, precious people that praise Him, that exalt Him, that lift Him up, that magnify Him, that remember the way that you have come. He has talked to me. He has talked to me. Just stay with me. God is trying to make us Pentecostal playthings. Conscious of our insufficiency. So he's brought us up to just where the miraculous will break through. And before he lets you build a bridge, he makes you stare at what you can't fix. And we can preach our best sermons. Choir, you are fabulous. I'm not trying to be unkind, but you can't do beans about the river either. I'm going to go a little further. And our resolutions won't do anything about it. And our legislation won't do anything about it. And all our stands against everything but fresh air won't do anything about it. There's only one thing going to open that river. I've got to die out to myself. I've got to realize that it's not by might and not by power. But it's by my spirit. Say it the Lord. Please be seated. I'm on a timer. Hear what I'm fixing to say. You and I are prone to self-sufficiency, self-reliance, self-trust. We carefully avoid everything that we cannot control. Now I'll ask you the $64,000 question. What are you attempting that's impossible unless God steps in? That's just what I thought. Nothing. You, pro you didn't hear me over here in the cheap seats? Let me try it again. What are you attempting that's totally impossible unless God intervenes. You didn't, you didn't hear me yet. Let me try it over here. 
What would you do? How would you live? How much would you sacrifice if you were convinced God would back it up? We got to get across this river or our Christianity will be nothing but a bunch of people that settle into little comfortable zones that doesn't cost us anything. My Lord have mercy. Self-determined comfort zones of the little Pentecostal glee club. Who blow and go and say, I believe there's a great day coming. There's a, I've been looking for that great day as long as Dorothy was walking the yellow brick road trying to find the Wizard of Oz and the Emerald Palace. You don't know what that is because you're all saved. I saw it in a book. Oh, hallelujah. We are being held hostage tonight by our fear of failure. So what's the difference if you fail? You're not a failure because you fail. You're only a failure if you accept failure as final. If you fall down, get up and try it again. If you make a mistake, confess your sin. We got blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. We gotta go across the river. Oh, hallelujah. Now, 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 now I'm gonna get ugly. Everybody just hold on, I'm gonna get ugly. I'm guilty of this, I hate to tell you. We are, we are being held hostage by the demon of image protection. I used to be offended when you people used to say I was crazy. And I was the guy that called people dirtbags and slobs and dingbats. And people laughed me off like there was no context or anything of what I said. It was just my slang and my Brooklynese verbiage. And I used to kind of suck my thumb and cry and be worried about it. But now after a long journey riding that horse, thank you. You have set me free. Your opinion don't affect me worth a hill of beans. You've written me off as crazy. I'm going to say what I want to say. If you think I'm crazy, it doesn't bother me anymore. What you say. I don't have an image, but I've got a river to get across. And me protecting my image is not going to take me into the promised possession. I've got to sacrifice my image. Oh. I'm taking a five minute break. Stop the clock. You hear me? Last year, when the Lord beat my brains out up here, and I read my text on breaking through that God would break forth, I never did preach my sermon. I guess God wasn't impressed with it. He used His sermon. It had nothing to do with holiness and righteousness and life. And I said all kinds of stuff that gave you guys a sudden headaches. You didn't know whether I was a hypocrite, a liar, or fake. You didn't know whether I believed fat meat was greasy. I got all kinds of crazy stuff from people. Didn't think I believed the message because of some statements I made. Let me explain something to you. When I told you that it wasn't anything you could do to get saved, there's nothing you could merit. It was the act of grace and your response was faith. But when I said, then whatever you do, you couldn't do anything to be lost. You people got the hiccups, you passed out, you thought I'd lost my mind. I watched these cats up here, they all wiggled around. I, I'm not stupid, I just look stupid. But let me explain to you. That when I went devastated into my motel room 
And I cried and stayed awake all night thinking, Dear God, what have you done to my image? What have you done to my popularity? You have ruined me. And God spoke to me. And you can just believe me or not believe me. He said, I intended to. Because as long as you stay safe within the portals of your image, you'll never challenge the river. And I began to ask the Lord, what's going on? And sitting on the plane flying home, God gave me a two-hour Bible study on something I said that I didn't plan to say, but it just came out. But what do you mean you're not going to be saved by what you do? I believe in living moral and modest and right and separated. What are you talking about? He said, no child, let me give you the Bible study. No child of mine will ever be lost because of what they do or fail to do. Because when my child commits sin, I will immediately bring to them conviction. If they confess, they are forgiven, restoration is done, and we walk on again. I said, well, what happens if they don't confess? He said, I get stronger. Now I bring chastisement. He said to me, Brother Kilgore, who do you think made David sick in Psalms 32? He was a man on the verge of a nervous breakdown because he's playing the hypocrite. He had taken some other guy's wife to bed, got her pregnant, killed the old man, and just played religious. Sound familiar? He said, I'll bring chastisement. Hebrews 12 said that I bring chastisement on my children that they might be partakers of my holiness. I was sitting on the plane, weeping, crying, writing notes. I said, what happens if chastisement doesn't work? He said, I get stronger. I said, my Lord. And he went step by step by step by step with me. He says, if chastisement doesn't work, then I'll do something that I very seldom ever do because I never want to do it to my children. He said, I'll bring to them open rebuke. He said, I sent Nathan because I wanted to save David. And he said, Jeffrey, don't ever think that when I sent Nathan, he was in his back bedroom by himself. I vilified and humiliated David in front of his whole court entourage that I might save him. And when the word cut like a two-edged sword, David began to bleed and the pus came out of his spirit. And he said, I'm guilty. I've sinned. Pray for me, preacher. And the scripture says the next verse, God has just put away your iniquity. Let's go walk together. I've got a revelation from God. He gave it to me. I said, what happens if open rebuke doesn't work? He said, by the way, who do you think raised up the ministry of the prophets? I did. I've used prophets to rebuke monarchs and kings and people and governments. They are my voice piece. I use them to touch people. Not because I hate them. If I want them lost, I stay silent. I said, what happens if the open rebuke doesn't work? Here's what he said to me. He said, then I bring judgment he showed me second chronicles 36 he said i sent preachers prophets many betimes raising early in the morning but there was no remedy therefore i sent judgment and he said but even judgment when my nation was in captivity when they repented i forgave and brought them back to me i said lord what happens when judgment doesn't work there was a long silence, Brother Kilgore. Now, you can think I'm, I'm on daffodils, I'm snorting cocaine. You can think anything you want. But I was on the plane, and all of a sudden, there was a black image that came into my eyes. I had my eyes closed. It looked like a black eraser. Came up to my face, and a, just a word flashed in that black eraser. And it said, reprobation. And he spoke to me and said, Jeffrey, if I cannot reach my children who are disobedient with conviction and chastisement 
and open rebuke and even judgment, then I cannot save them. But tell my people they will not be lost because of some deeds they do. They will be lost because they resist my overture of grace and mercy. I'm sorry to have wasted this time to tell you this, but I had to make the point. I said, we're image problem people. I cried, Brother Tenney, and I said, Lord, why didn't you tell me that when I burped that thing out about knew you would be lost by what you do? It could have helped thousands of people to understand the majesty of grace. And the Lord spoke to me again. He said, that's true. But you would have used it to spare your image. And I'm fixing to destroy it. Because you said you want to go to a higher plateau. Well, to go to the higher plateau, it means I must break down and destroy the level at which you're used to living so comfortable. I'm sorry if I've lost you here. I didn't mean to lose you. Fear of failure. Held hostage by image protection. And then finally the dumbest of all. Opinions of your peers. Ain't a one of you cats ever paid my light bill. You ain't even give me ten bucks for gas. You ain't never paid my insurance payments. Most of you have never even called me or sent me a Christmas card. What do I give a flip about your opinion? There's only one opinion that matters, my friend. J-E-S-U-S. -S. Is he pleased? Is he happy? Am I doing something worthy of the mercy I have received? I must quickly go. Hurry. Here we go. All these things, fear of failure, image protection, opinions appears, keep you and I from attempting anything that we can't control, that we cannot supply with in our own resource, or accomplish within our own ability. Thus the river laughs at us. problem with all that concept and philosophy and principle is you always leave God out. You avoid the trouble, true, but you also avoid the triumph. Let me try it again. How would you act? How would you live if you were sure he'd step in? What would you try when you go home if you were sure he wouldn't leave you hanging? The only reason Abraham takes Isaac up Moriah, he is totally convinced his dad will meet him. He said, we're going to worship. We're coming back. I don't know how, I don't know how long, but I'm totally convinced that he's going to do something spectacular if I can get on the other side of this river of impossibility. <laughs> Failing to see the invisible restrains every one of us from attempting the impossible. It is God tonight who is seeking to shut you and I up to himself. He is arranging our camping at the river right now. It was God who made Abraham camp 20 plus years at the river of impossibility to have a son before it was impossible for him biologically and for Sarah biologically to have the Bambino. It was the river of impossibility 
And so then when God depleted him and drained him and he lost all his resource, then God said, let's go across the river. You're not hearing me. David is anointed to ascend the throne, but it's almost 20 years being chased, living like a rat in caves and holes, lied on, javelins chasing him, scared half to death, losing his own faith, until finally he comes to the end of his resource, and then God puts him on the throne. Could I use this illustration? It's Mary and Martha who lived four days at the river of impossibility and hurt feelings and disappointments while Jesus makes sure there's nothing can help Lazarus but his coming. God has got a bunch of us up against the Jordan River tonight because he doesn't want to frustrate us. He wants to take us across. But we're too full of our own strength. Let's say it again. That river. That dirty river. That nasty river. Dear God, I hate that river. <laughs> Elijah forced to live at the river God sends him to a little brook called Cherith wasn't a Cherith place but he was sent to a place where a dirty bird feeds him twice a day kind of humiliating for a prophet of God who just walked into Ahab's chicken dinner and said ain't no rain coming Jack till I'm back have a nice day <laughs> and while he's checking his biceps and polishing his prophecy medals after he did his thing God did not hide this dude at the, ro at the brook cheer it to spare him from Ahab he hid him to spare him from Elijah Too much metal polishing going on around Pentecost. Too many pictures of self being displayed. We're at the river right now. God wants to take us across. But we're going to have to die out to ourselves and admit that we can't do it. I'm almost finished with page one. How would you feel if you were a prophet of God? Shut up the heavens with just one statement. No rain till I talk. And then God would have the audacity to go hide you. I need to be preaching a conference. And God says, I got something better than you preaching a conference. I'm going to give you a showdown on Carmel, but I'll have to hide you a while. Yeah. Go live by a drying brook and a dirty bird that brings you food twice a day. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing to me? Oh, uh, you're not humble enough. Oh, uh, you're, uh, you're not empty enough. I've got on my agenda, Carmel. You're going to take on 850 false prophets. You're going to whip their hide. You're going to call fire down from heaven. You're going to end a three and a half year drought with one prayer meeting. But you're too full of yourself right now. Go over here by the brook. And when the brook dries up and the birds lose the zip code, then God turns around and says, You know what? You're making a little progress, but... But you're not doing too well. I'm going to let some little widow Gentile feed you. I often wondered why he made a Gentile feed him. I think it's because he couldn't get any Jews to feed him. <laughs> Tragedy at Pentecost when people that don't even have the truth treat you nicer than your family. You did ask me to preach, did you not? 
Well, then let me tell you the truth. We're at the river right now. God wants to take us across, but we got to get honest. I'm, 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 I'm winding down here. Sure I am. He sends him to Cheerith. Anybody know what, 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 what Cheerith meant? I don't know what it meant. He took him from Cheerith and he sent him to Zarephath. I do know what Zarephath meant. Zarephath means smelting place. It was where alloy was taken out of molten metal to enhance its value. Very humiliating, eating a widow's groceries. Preaching your sermons in the back of a little shanty. Sticking your head out the window and say, You cats won't know why there ain't no rain. <laughs> and God shoves him back in the window. You ain't empty yet. The only reason we haven't gone over the river yet, we're too stinking full of ourselves. We actually believe we can do it. We cannot do it. But there's one among us who's going to do it. Just a few more minutes. And after he finally gets emptied at Zarephath, then God kind of tings the metal and goes, ding, <laughs> empty, <laughs> dead, no more self-promo, I can trust him publicly now. I can put you into a miraculous situation. You will not get intoxicated. And don't you see the picture? Elijah walking on the top of Carmel. Like one of those crazy tigers and lions in a zoo. Just going back and forth wanting that. He's wanting these 850 jerks, man. They're just kind of bred for him. He's ready. He ain't, he ain't worried about getting his picture taken. He's going, oh, I've been through the school. I'm at, I've, been, I've been at the river. We're fixing to cross over here right now. I finally realized I didn't shut up the heavens. He shut up the heavens. I was just a mouthpiece. I didn't get nobody healed. He did the healing. I was just a vessel. I couldn't pray nobody through. God gives people the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I can't build a great church. I'm a schnook. I'm a dodo. I'm just a vessel. I want to be used, but I can't take the credit. Just a few more minutes. Let me try it again. We are too strong for him. We are too strong for him to use us like he wants to use us. You're not hearing me. You say, well, it didn't take him too long. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you what. It took him 40 years to empty Moses. What was that 40 year stint out there with them stupid sheep and that talking bush? It was this guy who said, I can pull this jailbreak off. I'll kill them Egyptians one at a time. He ran out of time before he ran out of Egyptians. Old Moses became a murderer in one day and God just took him off the scene and said, whoa, we got to take this guy back over here. I'm fixing to use this dude for the biggest jailbreak that's ever recorded in history. Three million people broke out of jail in one night, and this is the guy that's got the key. But he's so full of stupidity and wisdom and the selfishness and the righteousness of Egypt. I just got to stick him out here and play with the sheep and let him get a suntan and let him talk to himself and let his dreams die and let his visions die and let the miracle thoughts die until finally one day he realizes he ain't worth nothing but taking care of sheep. And boom, here comes the bush burning here comes the voice of the angel of the Lord said you 
You thought I lost your address. I didn't lose your address. I've had you in the process. Now you're ready to go across the river. I'm making sense. Just a, just a little bit. Canaan was Israel's by divine deed. It was God's gracious gift. It was given to them, but it must be claimed. It was promised, but it must be possessed. Cities were there by decree, but they must be captured. Houses were heaven's reward, but they must be inhabited and appropriated. That's why Ephesians 1 and 3 says, God has blessed us with all spiritual and rich heavenly things in heavenly places. That's a nice scripture to quote, but that's the other side of the river. They must be appropriated. And you have to only appropriate them when you are dead to yourself. Jordan is symbolic of death. Flesh can't handle death. Death handles flesh. I'll confess again. I've been trying to get across that river for 20 years. When fasting didn't work, prayer didn't work, I tried to build a bridge. I looked for a boat. I tried to tunnel. And the river just laughs. Get back on the bank, fat boy. You can't make it. You're staring at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. I do. The key to the river opening and you possessing your possessions was the three-day delay. It was the pause that produced the power. And they sat on the banks of impossibility for three days as they recollected, reminisced, recalled all the graciousness and faithfulness and power and goodness and provision of God. And when they got to the end, then they looked at the river of impossibility and said, what are we going to do with this? 72 hours to drain from ability and self-reliance, and we can do it. How many besides me make these commitments that never work? Vows, pledges, I promise, going to fast till my belly button falls off. I'm... <laughs> I'm going to pray until my tongue hits my shoes. I'm going to give. I'm going to go. Yeah. And I'm back at the brink of the river trying to find another boat. And the disgusting thing is the river laughs as it passes by. And you're standing on the brink and you're looking over at what you desire and what God has decreed and promised. And you go, that's mine. And the river goes. God said, that's mine. And if you check the river, it's very turbulent and very fast moving. And it brings debris down from the mountains. It has branches and trees and things that it's carved out as it ran down. It's dirty, it's filthy, and it's laughing at you. Ready? Say, that river. That nasty river. Said, I hate that river. Almost there. Just hold on. Took him three days. It's not a fluke that the Lord said, make him stay three days. Because three days is always a picture in the scripture of death, burial, and resurrection. And Canaan is resurrection turf. But we like to walk on resurrection turf without having to die and get buried. <laughs> you know what else it says? This is powerful. In verse 15 it says, Jordan overflowed all his banks in the time of harvest. You know what God did? He brought them up at the worst time. 
And I was running around, Rexy Dale, in my, in my room. The poor slob was next to me, thought I was out of my tree. I was running and screaming and talking in tongues and laughing and yelling tonight. Before I came here, I said, God, you just showed this to me. This is so nifty. You have brought this church to a time when the raging river is out of control. Society has brimmed over its evil banks. Our social affairs are a disaster. Adulteries everywhere. Fornications everywhere. Abortions everywhere. Disease is everywhere. Crime is everywhere. It's overflowing its banks. And God said, I custom made this time to bring my church to the overflow. bring the church right to the swollen banks of Jordan to show them that society cannot stop what I've designed. Oh, about ten more minutes, ten more minutes. Ten more minutes, I'm finished. Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Sure. The blessed and promised possession that you and I desire can never be attained by resolutions, by pledges, by human ability, by human effort and goodness. It can only be accomplished by the pause that sanctifies. The man said, make the people stay here three days and then Joshua says, now sanctify yourself for tomorrow the wonders start. We're waiting for a special gift and a special ministry and a special this and a special that and God has told my poor little uneducated brain, Jeffrey it's so easy, tell the people pause to sanctify. Oop, I didn't think I'd get much amen on that one. We'd rather work at something that we're good at. He says, Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The opening of the river of impossibility and the crossing over to resurrection turf and the falling of Jericho's walls and the saving of the Gentile Rahab waits on the church to sanctify. And let me tell you something, and I'm not an unkind person. Rude, yes, but not unkind. I'm not vicious. I'm not using this to get anything off my chest. The river is overflowing its banks. And there's been some of us stupid people who have thought that the best way to get across the river is to get rid of some stuff that brought us to the river. Everybody I've talked to that has quote, left this damnable land of bondage and barriers to liberty and have now gone into this new, I don't know what you call it, craziness. I've asked a lot of them, I said, I want to know something now that your, your wife looks like uh, whatever she looks like and, and you look like whatever you look like and, and now you have lost the bondage shackles that held you back from the promised land. And now you're way up on the mountain of transfiguration as low dirt bags are down here with all these shackles of bondage like modesty and morality. I said, tell me something. I've asked them to their face, God is my witness. Now that you don't have these shackles anymore, tell me about your new prayer life. Tell me about the new things that Jesus has showed you now that you're free to walk the land of liberty. Speak to me of the revelations of his greatness and his nature. 
I'm not being rude. I'm being honest. Maybe I'm wrong. So I'm asking these people, now that you're wearing just a Band-Aid, now that you've got liberty to sit, I'm going to hurt you now. Now that you've got liberty to sit your ignorant carcass in front of HBO and watch dirty language and nudie flicks, tell me about the new victory that you have from Jesus. You lying little hypocrite. It's your flesh that wants to do that. It's got nothing to do with the Spirit of God. It's got nothing to do with crossing the river. You're not going to cross the river by prostituting truth. Joshua didn't say, get rid of everything you believe. Get rid of your modesty and your morality and your righteousness and whatever understanding you have about holy living. So you can be lighter to go across. You're not taking it across. Your works aren't taking it across. The Ark of the Covenant's going into the water. God's going to roll back the water. Almost there. Sanctify yourselves. For tomorrow, God will do wonders. So what he's saying is the wonders of God that you desperately desire await your full consecration. It's a scary scripture found in this little chapter. It talks about two and a half tribes who said... We'd like the spiritual adventure, but we have no heart for that side of Jordan. There's people moving among us, be careful, who like the feeling, like the joy, like the singing, the preaching, as long as it doesn't touch anything they believe. But they have no heart to go into the land you're wanting to go into. Their heart is already settled on the wrong side of Jordan. And when they go and do their little war, they're going back. Why? They chose the pasture that they thought would best feed them. They did it on a carnal feeling. They didn't think that God could make grass grow on the other side. And the cattle could take care of it and the sheep could take care of it on that side. I'm telling you, if we'll just follow God, He can make a barren place to become a Garden of Eden. He can make a desolate place to burst forth with fruitfulness. We don't need to stay on the wrong side of Jordan we've got to go towards Jericho I'm, I'm trying I'm trying the two and a half tribes that stayed on the wrong side of Jordan were nothing but worldly believers who make sometimes periodic excursions into the promises and the places and the presence of God but they're very happy to live as close to the world as they can and still not be called worldly Not prepared to abandon their fascination with the world and the sense realm that holds them hostage. I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm a sweet man. He said, sanctify yourself. That means cleanse your conscience. Purify your motives. Abandon all hindrances. Lay aside the weights, the sins, the practices that hinder holiness's progress. For holiness is two-sided. It's like a battery. It's got the positive side and the negative side. The positive side is the infusion of the divine nature of God, whereby we are imputed. No, imputed is righteousness. Imparted is holiness. The negative side is what you and I do once we have been given this nature. That's why Second Chronicles, Corinthians 7 and 1 says, Wherefore, cleanse yourself from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God has done His responsibility. Now you do yours. That's not bondage. That's Bible.
I'm finishing. There's no need for you and I to dread tomorrow because tomorrow will be full of wonders providing that we sanctify today. I'd be scared to death of tomorrow without the wonders of God. But the wonders are awaiting our consecration to put off the old man and put on the new man and forsake every form of evil and present our bodies a living sacrifice. Our tomorrows will be full of wonders and they will never cease. For the separating of Jordan is just as easy as the falling of the walls of Jericho. Oh, the power of the pause. God has brought this meeting to this moment. There could be released in here in three minutes a demonstration of the divine power of God if we would really decide to get naked, transparent, open, and make a fresh dedication. Here we go. Not to read off-color things. Not to watch TV or video that arouses you sensually or sexually or puts puke and dirt and crud in your mind. Yeah, 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 you stare me down all you want to. We are circumventing the wonders of God when we indulge our ignorant flesh in things we know we should not do. They leave us tainted. They leave us dirty. They leave us with a feeling of guilt and shame. And we wish to God we hadn't read it, we hadn't said it, we hadn't watched it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How are you and I to keep loving a world that hates Him? How are we trying to embrace and love a spirit that crucified Him? Jordan always flows between us and our promised places. And I'm on my way to close right now, once and only. I'm going to be the real boogaboo right now. Because here it is. Here's the key. And if you refuse to do this, as kindly as I can tell you, you are stupid. You are the biggest nincompoop that ever walked in flesh if you fail to do what I'm asking you to do. It's so simple, it's profound. You ready? Name your Jordan. Identify the river that separates you from the possession. Is it the opposition of a loved one? Is it a person you know who persecutes you? Is it a circumstance in a situation? I'm going to get nasty. Is it a passion? unbridled is it the tyranny my god I feel the Holy Ghost is it the tyranny of a habit is it a reoccurring fault is it unconquered desire is it jealousy is it a hurt that the Reverend talked about that's never healed is it an unforgiven event? Is it a dream dashed and you haven't forgiven God because He let someone else have your place? We are at the swelling of Jordan and God gave Joshua instruction and said, Tell the priests that bear the ark to get their feet wet. We want the wonders and we want our feet dry. 
The scripture says, when they stepped in the brink of the river, now watch me, it didn't appear like very much happened. The miracle started 19 miles north up at the city of Adam. It took a while for it to appear in front of them. And the act of faith was step and stand still and wait for the wonder. And while they stood and waited, the water built up into a heap, and those going south went down. Isn't it strange that in the Hebrew language, the word Jordan means descender. It takes everything down with it to a dead sea. It may appear right now that God is leading you to disaster and destruction and folly and finality of all effort. I am telling you in the fear of God, God is wanting people who are priests, who have the ark in them, to step into your raging river and watch God separate. I believe it. You can stand with me now. I'm so sorry I didn't really preach good. Everybody was wanting me to preach so good. No. And Elisha the prophet's got a little dilemma on his hands because a guy is doing the best he can for the work of God. And what do you think happens? In the midst of duty, the guy is damaged by losing the axe head. And where does the axe head fall? In Jordan. But what does God do? He says, tell everybody, it doesn't matter what you've lost, and how long you've lost it, and how far it's fallen. I'm the Lord of the resurrection. Yeah. And the iron did swim. Some of us have lost our desire, our dreams, our cutting edge, our fervency, our prayer life, our commitment, our believability. But God is wanting to give you a resurrection in the Jordan. What seemed totally lost was within a hand's grasp. What seemed forever lost, the preacher man said, reach out your hand, and he took it. If your river will open, if you will recover what you've lost, you're going to have to get wet. Let's thank the Lord for the Word of God. Uh.